This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders, a farm is being run by five hand-picked experts as it would have been nearly 400 years ago. Using only resources available in the year 1620, they are laboring for a full calendar year, turning the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. It's April, our eighth month here on the farm, and spring has truly sprung. 400 years ago, on a day like today, a farmer's wife would be doing as many jobs as possible out here in the sun and the fresh air. We've got a lot to be getting on with. Out in the fields, there's um, a lot of spring sowing to be done. All the peas and beans need to get in. My first job this month, though, is to uh, totally turn over this house, drag everything out, give it a scouring from top to bottom, a real spring clean. Before the April cleaning begins, the farmhouse needs to be cleared. There's not much in the way of furniture. Some trestle tables, cupboards, and a few chairs. The first thing to be cleaned is the chimney, and Stuart is the one going up the ladder. The cheapest way of doing this is to tie a bit of holly bush onto a good stout rope, take it up the ladder, drop the rope down the chimney, and then we just pull it through from underneath. And Holly's great because it bends, it'll deform around the chimney, should slide past all the bars that we've got in there, and give it a good scratch and scrape out, bring that soot down before we get a chimney fire, which potentially could be absolutely fatal. As ever, Alex and Fonz are ready to get their hands dirty. OK, Stuart, you ready? Yep. Let's get it going. <laughs> like most jobs on a farm 400 years ago, Chimney sweeping wouldn't be left to an expensive outside specialist. Instead, it was just another of the basic tasks that the farmer's family did themselves. Oh, yeah. This is the painful bit. <laughs> yeah. While the chimney is being swept, Ruth and Chloe are beginning work on the fabrics. Right there, I'll I'll hang this down. This one. That hasn't got any and the first it. jobs of spring cleaning really is to get all the woolen textiles out of the house and give them a darn good airing, choose a nice, bright, sunny day so we can blow all the dust away, beat all the bits and bobs out. These are things that it's quite hard and not necessarily a good idea to, to water wash too much. So, um, hang on, let me put this. Yeah, do you want to pull the yeah. pole down for me? In the 17th century, the main textiles on a farm were homespun wool. Linen or hemp? I'm going to get those sticks. That's all the way in, Stuart. That's in. It's not <laughs> coming at all. <laughs> We've absolutely no idea how much stuff is going to come out, but by the feel of it, hopefully in this first go, we should get all of it and we won't need to do it again. Part of the way up the chimney are some bars for hanging meat to smoke. It looks like the holly has got snagged. I'll just have a quick wreck here. OK, Fonz? Yeah? You see where it's stuck? Yeah, it's just stuck on one of these the S-hooks, actually, yeah, the smoking bar. But there we go. That should be, it should be free now. Yeah, let me yeah. come down. Oh. Right, got you right, There's certainly a lot of stuff up there. So here we go, but it should come quite easily now. So here we go. That's quite a bit there. These are the curtains off the bed, and they're coming out along with all the other woolen textiles. With April upon them, the team need to prepare for sowing seeds out in the fields. Inside, Ruth and Chloe have to clear up the chimney debris before ash and dust blow all over the house. 
Triangle Field was wasteland six months ago. Preparing it for crops has been excruciating labor, a seemingly losing battle against a mass of gnarled roots. These are the bramble roots, and these are the bracken roots. If we don't get rid of them, they'll regrow and they'll kill our pea crop. So what we're doing is we're building pyres and we're going to burn them and use them as fertilizer back on the field. They won't burn like a raging fire, they should smolder with big plumes of white smoke. Sweeping out the farmhouse can now begin in earnest. I'm trying to get all the smoke and ash dust off all these little ledges on the wall, you can see, because it's an uneven surface. Uh, obviously, just like nowadays, some people are more house proud than others. And um, references to people often mention how clean a woman was about her house. So, you know, it obviously mattered to people. and They obviously discussed it and, and gossiped about, you know, Mrs. So-and-so doesn't keep a very clean house. Mrs. So-and-so, oh, she's pristine and lovely. Just like today, really. So it's, it's sort of different sort of dirt. There's certainly a lot more sort of dust, mud and smoke sort of um, particles than most modern people have. But then again, there's probably less house mites because we have more fresh air coming through and there's less textiles. It's quite a lot of stuff up here and it's actually coming down from between the, the cracks in the floorboards of the room above. So especially with this broom, it's got quite, quite pointy bits on the ends and it gets right into the cracks and sort of deposits it on your head, which is delightful. For cleaning about the house, farmers' wives made ingenious use of natural resources. I'm using a goose wing here, just the, the very end of a um, goose we had earlier on in the year to eat. And it makes a really good sort of duster come small brush. Gets in all the corners. Good for getting out cobwebs and bits that accumulate. There's not a lot of point me sweeping the floor until that's finished. No, none whatsoever. Do you want to do the wall? Yeah, right. Well, we'll start with the one in the middle. The mass of roots, turf and twigs dug out of Triangle Field now need disposing of. I've just got a, a strip of canvas which we've um, just pasted a bit of pitch on and wrapped it around the end of this stick. So it just smokes away. If you need a flame, just give it a bit of a blow. What I'm going to do is I'm, I built a sort of flue under these pyres. And hopefully the faggots that we've set underneath the pile should get it kick-started. It's not something I've ever done before, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it will... Um, It'll take and it'll smolder. It will probably, I should imagine, take over a day, if not longer. This one, I think, is on its way. Pyres provide a very effective way of destroying waste while keeping fire under control. Yours ready, Stuart? Yeah, might as well get them all. Yeah. Get them all going. It's not just the bramble and bracken that's killed by this process, but all the weed seed that's lurking there in the soil as well, just waiting to sprout in the spring and compete with our crops. So it sterilises the whole soil. But in the process, we destroy all the organic matter that's in there. We keep the chemicals, the nitrogens and the phosphoruses and so forth that are in there, but we lose the organic matter that holds the soil together. So once we uh, have finished the burn, then we're going to have to put that organic material back by putting loads and loads of dung onto this soil to give it body so that it actually holds together again and retains water. It's the end of a long day. The root pyres in Triangle Field seem to have been a great success, but no one really knows how many weeds are still lurking to threaten their pea crop. But the farm work isn't over. 
Fonz and Chloe have to mount an all-night vigil over one of their cows who is due to give birth any time now in the cow shed. It must be about one in the morning and we've, we've crept out of bed because we've got Duchess in the cow shed at the moment because we think tonight is going to be the night that she gives birth. Um, we're just here just to check up on her. I mean, we've got her food and some water but um, we've heard a few noises and myself and Chloe we've, um, we've both crept out to, just to see how she's doing. Feels fine. I, mean, I can't feel anything kicking in there. She's she's really very, very placid, very docile. I think the very fact that she's letting us get this close to her could mean she's she's imminent. But she she seems quite calm. I mean, she, every now and then her breathing picks up, gets quite rapid. She lies down, so we're assuming that it's it's coming. It's on its way. It's a very hardy breed, Welsh Black. They're very. Very sturdy beef cattle, yeah. these really. They, they can survive all weathers. Um, it's just the newborn calf that we're a bit worried about. That's the reason why Duchess is in here. The following morning, and there's no new calf. Duchess remains resolutely pregnant. We've had a sleepless vigil with Duchess tonight, and nothing's happened. I'm going to let her out into the big field now and she'll rejoin the other cows, well, we'll see. We'll keep our eye on her and then probably bring her in again tonight. And hopefully before then I can get some sleep. Duchess has already had 12 calves in the past, so the team aren't really expecting any problems with the birth, but they'd rather be safe than sorry. She's rejoined the herd sort of really quickly. They were calling each other this morning, which makes a complete racket. And she seems really eager to get onto that morning dew grass. So yeah, they, they all seem really happy. And it's been quite an experience actually. It's quite fun staying up, watching the cows. I mean, I, I feel quite, I feel quite alive actually, <laughs> quite awake. Some of the animals have demolished an old field boundary, so dry stone waller Nicholas McElvena has come to give Stuart a much needed helping hand. Dry stone walling's the sort of skill that every farmer would have because he'd patch the small bits himself. But for the bigger jobs, you'd have laborers who've worked up particular specialities. Some were hedges and ditches, some would have been dry stone wallers. So it was one of the ways in which they earned a bit of money to pay the rent. Well, principles of stone walling are basically you've got random shapes and you're trying to fit them together into a kind of solid form, you know, interlocking, much the same as a jigsaw puzzle. In fact, I used to do loads of jigsaw puzzles as a child and uh, I attribute that to being able to do stone walls now. Yeah. Other way up. Yeah, I'm tucking them underneath them. You're holding a three-dimensional shape in your head. You see a gap and you're looking around for that stone. And one way or another, you recognise it as soon as you, as you spot it and it slots in there quite easily. Big ones for the edge? I fancy that one there. This one? No, beyond. That with one? The, with the layers in strata, yeah. In the valley's farmyard, Ruth and Chloe continue with their spring clean. Their first task today is changing the beds. 400 years ago, um, the very, very rich had sort of marvellous eider down, and then lower down it was other sorts of feather beds or feather mattresses, um, flock or wool for sort of most sort of farming farmers. And then right at the bottom for servants, labourers, that sort of person, cheapest of all, was hay and straw. Of course, at the end of the winter, it smells, frankly. Sort of fousty, isn't it? It's a bit musty. And parasites have you know, have a chance of building up things like lice if you're not careful. Actually only been here a couple of weeks before I got I got quite badly bitten around my knees. Anywhere my skin was in contact with the um with the mattress, it was really nasty actually. But four hundred years ago there were things you could do to try and stop bugs invading your bed. It helps to keep the um, insects at bay, to use insecticides in your hay, um, otherwise known as herbs. Um, there's quite a number of herbs that have quite strong 
anti-insect properties. Because this is unimproved pasture, there's no um, chemicals gone on it, lots of different species grow in amongst the grass, including ladies' bed straw. And it, it's something that helps with insects and also helps with the smell. It's got a really nice, fresh smell that lasts, well, pretty much all year. Dry stone walls weren't the only way of securing a field boundary. Hedge laying was a quicker option, but where hedges require regular maintenance, stone walls are a much more permanent solution. And the materials needed are quite literally lying around on the fields waiting to be cleared. Once you've brought your stones in off the field, you've put them up into a stable shape. You've got yourself a wall, which a barrier, which is going to keep your stock out for probably about 150 to 200 years. Maybe with a little bit of maintenance where a cow's tried to get over or trees come down or something, but really it should be a, a stable block there. Swing a straight in there, Stuart. There's two sorts of dry stone wall that you find around in the country these days. Some of the really ancient ones, which go way, way back, certainly back to the 1620s. Um, and these tend to be small fields, curved walls. But you shouldn't confuse those with the sort of massive lengths that you get across the middle of the uh, Yorkshire Dales, which are all Victorian or 18th century enclosure walls from the Acts of Parliament when they carved up the fells. Makes you realize really just how the mattresses are shaping up well. Back in the reign of James I, there were no easy care duvets, but they weren't exactly sleeping rough. They're quite comfortable as long as you put enough hay in them. If you don't put enough hay in, they tend to go very flat very quickly. They do this. And yeah. you end up with, with um, holes sort of under your, your bum and under your shoulders and wherever, what point you lie on. And... Right, ready? There we go. Yep. Mine's going the way up. Ready? Ah, <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, wriggle up. <sighs> oh, that's not bad. Wake me up when it's dinner time. Uh, dinner. Oh, this is so comfy. Down in Triangle Field, the root bonfires have worked a treat, smouldering down to a fine ash. Now it just needs spreading around, putting some goodness back into the soil, as recommended by the farming manuals of the time. Gervais Markham makes reference to doing this. If you want to turn a field over from kind of heathland, of course, they would have known back then that the ash is ideal for turning these kind of acidic soils into the kind of soils that we'll need to grow our peas in. It's not a project I'll enter into lightly again, I think. Fresh April dawn marks a special day in the valley with a brand new addition to the farm team. After weeks of anxious waiting, Duchess has finally given birth. Yeah, last night Duchess gave birth to a, a calf, a, a bull calf. Um, it was a hor horrible night last night, lots of hail, lots of wind. We've got this, this beautiful new calf. You forget how small they are, very black, so uh, quite hard to see in a black cow shed at night. Duchess seems to be um, good. She, she's been resting, she's been eating. I think she's probably eager to get out. It's a beautiful day out there, a beautiful spring day. And um, oh, it's a beautiful day to be born, actually. As of yet, we haven't decided on a name for him. Uh, my guess would be Big Ears. <laughs> he does have big ears. But um, we, we'll think of something. I thought it wasn't far off the back. With the first section of wall finished, Nick and Stuart begin the next. Laying the foundations is the most important task. All the big base stones have to be precisely manoeuvred into position. The tools of the trade are very basic and probably haven't changed for hundreds of years. Your lump hammer for just compounding the, the soil around but also just breaking off your blocks and making 
sure everything's seated down. Just your basic lump of metal. And then the iron bar, which is probably the most valuable tool, because with that you can move anything up to five, six times your own weight and manoeuvre stones where you'd just break your back otherwise. So for me, if I had to choose one tool, it would be the iron bar for the wall. Here we have a modern day brickies hammer. It's very good for just doing the final little dressings and adjustments to stones if there's a fiddly bits or breaking a bit off there. Now this is a hammer head which I found underneath some flagstones in the Tudor house, not far from here at all. And it hasn't really changed in design over the period as you can see. The weight and the profiles are exactly the same and they, they would have done exactly the same job. Now the tradesman that lost this would have cursed. Important as these tools all are, the most important ones are your hands. Down in Triangle Field, the next job is muck spreading. Alex and Fons have brought in Blackthorn to shift the compost on their convertible hay sledge. Whoa, 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 that's it. How am I doing, Fons, at the back? Fine. Okay, you just want to hold her steady. She's very docile, isn't she? I've just got some offcuts of wood that I'm going to lay down as planks on our hay sledge to turn it into a makeshift dung cart. Farms of the period, much bigger ones, with a lot more arable, they would have had a, probably, a dung box sat on the back of a sledge. That should be a good enough platform for us to put our dung on. After mucking out the cow shed over winter, the team have built up a decent sized dung heap to fertilize their fields. Come on, go. Good girl. Come on. It's going up now. Slowly now, we don't want it going all the way. Just nice and easy. You're so good. we're dealing here with about quarter to half a tonne of stone. And with just two bars, we've been able to lift the thing up, put it more or less exactly where we want. We'll just see. Right, it's, it's moving to me. Do you want to steady it on the other side and slow it down? Get a bit more leverage on this. Now Lent's over, and people 400 years ago kept to it much more rigorously than people tend to do these days. A whole new diet arrives, partly because we've stopped fasting, but um, perhaps more importantly, just because the turning of the year, there's different foodstuffs available. So it's a completely different diet to what we've been eating, thank goodness. Um, we've got lots of fresh spring stuff from the garden. We've got um, young veal. Um, we've got lots and lots of milk, products and indeed loads of eggs. The chickens are laying nicely now. Chloe's going to make us a salad. Um, she's got some chives, sorrel, salad bonnet and smallage out of the garden which has come nice. And I'm going to start off with a, a custard. So I'm using up all these lovely eggs. I think that'll probably be enough. And I've got loads of cream and some of the morning's milk. Custard was a really popular dish 400 years ago, just as it is now, really. I'm just going to flavour it with a little dash of rose water, which is um, distilled water with the essence of uh, damask roses. I suppose in a modern one you'd use vanilla, um, but rose water was a much more popular condiment. I'm going to whisk it all up, and I'm going to pop it in some little tarts. I've baked the cases blind already in the oven, so once I've popped this in, it'll just take 20 minutes, half an hour, in a nice cool oven to set the custard. That's it, and whoa, 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 that's cool. Alex and Fonz's hay sledge come dung cart seems to be doing the job. But it's going to take plenty of trips with Blackthorn to cover the whole field with a rich layer of fertilizer. A bit of a problem. In the course of a day, you reckon on doing about six yards of stone wall, which isn't that much to look at, but it all adds up over the course of a week or two. 
you can get a lot of satisfaction from working with the stones, especially when you have a productive period. Maybe for a few hours, everything's just slotting in nicely. You've got some good stone, and it's all fitting in together. In two days, Stuart and Nick have replaced about eight metres of stone wall, making the boundary between the top orchard and the main field once again secure. The rest of the eggs I'm going to use to make a tansy, which is a bit like an omelette, really. Um, and it gets its name from the herb which I've gathered out the garden here. I want to get just the juice out of it, and I'm not going to use a huge amount. People 400 years ago knew that it was um, slightly toxic, and indeed used it medicinally because of that, because in a high quantity, it can drive the worms out of your gut, you know, if you've got worms in your own body. <laughs> that should be bruised now. I'm just going to squeeze the juice out and let it drop into the eggs. Just got to whisk this up and then put it to one side. We'll fry it in butter just before dinner. The team aren't just seeing a big change of diet. The coming of spring is having another profound effect. It's got to the time of year with, with the longer evenings and the earlier mornings where you've got so much more time in daylight that the whole, your whole mood changes. You become so much more optimistic. I can imagine how 400 years ago, it must have just been such a difference to the, to the feeling and the, the way you work. You feel you have more energy and, and just more drive, generally. It's been hard work for Fonz and Alex, spreading the muck on their soon-to-be-sowed pea bed. But Blackthorn has done the trick for them. They're on their sixth and last muck run. It's quite hard to get the dung up and down, especially if we were doing it manually, that takes a long time. I mean, each, each dung, load, dung cartful is probably about, I reckon, about eight wheelbarrow loads. So that's uh, eight trips we don't have to make. On the platform, forward, forward. And whoa, 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 whoa. That's it. Good girl, good girl. April was a common time for a farmer to set aside one of his calves for slaughter, providing rennet and veal, today's main meal. I'm going to slice this up into lots of thin little um, steaks or, you know, like escalops, I suppose, if you're being posh. Um, and then we're going to um, sear them. It's called carbonadoing, and it's very similar to sort of barbecuing, frankly. Oh, you can hear that, can't you? <laughs> smell it. <laughs> well, let me see if I can loosen it and turn it. With the fire up to heat and the coals flattened to make a good cooking bed, the carbonado de veal and tansy omelette are looking good. Oh, Lord, it is green. Look at it. Yeah, it is, isn't it? There we go. Fantastic. Yes, yes. Yeah, go on, sit down. I'm nearly there. Exhausted. How's it all going? Mm hmm. On my legs. Carbonado de veal. Delicious. After a good spring clean, the team are dining in a nicely spruced up farmhouse. Triangle Field is well on the way. The stone walls are intact. And as summer draws on, they now have a new calf to look after. It's like some Barbie, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is very much like Barbie. Mm. Can I? That's delicious. Take a. Yeah, point. I think they're much better without sugar. Mm. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? You know, you sort of modern things. I think put sugar on absolutely everything. Well, well after them. <laughs> I have to say, this is an absolute feast. Next time in the valley, it's May and flowers and blossom fill the farm's meadows. The field needs to be ready for spring sowing. This harrowing is working like a dream. The team try their hand at charcoal burning. And it's time to get busy making butter. <laughs> 